My name is uh, Jay Chauhan. I'm a mentor in uh, Ontario with a number of uh, lawyers who are launching their practices. I am a court of the bar in three jurisdictions, but I do lectures in many other jurisdictions as well. And uh, we choose a topic every Wednesday to talk about, to sensitize both the public as well as the lawyers in terms of the legal issues that the public encounters and the lawyers encounter and how do we deal with those issues is the, is the kind of program that we do every Wednesday at noon. And everybody's uh, invited to join the program. And for today's program, we have Yannick and Naman who will be, who are lawyers. Uh, who I think uh, in terms of the qualifications, Naman is called to the bar in uh, several jurisdictions. Uh, Yannick has been in two jurisdictions and both are also called to the bar in Ontario. So today's topic will be on the subject of mortgage uh, financing. And uh, the way we'll do this program is to essentially get uh, Naman to ask questions. And if Yannick is ready, she can ask questions as well. And then I will hear the comments and the question and then uh, deal with my comment on that issue. So if we can uh, have you, Naman, give your background and then uh, we'll start the session. Hi everyone, my name is Naman Sharma. I am a lawyer based in Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada. I am also a lawyer in Ontario and India. Uh, today I have here with me Mr. Jay Chauhan and the Yannick Russell with whom we will be conducting a session on a topic that is financing, refinancing. This topic is specifically with regard to the real estate in Canada. And uh, this session will be in the form of question answer sessions, whereby I'll be asking questions to Mr. J and he will be providing our audience with his valuable insights on those questions. So, and uh, now, uh, before we start the session, I would like uh, Yannick to say a few words. Thank you, Naman. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Yannick Russell, and I'm a lawyer here in Ontario, Canada. I practice primarily immigration, business law, and wills and estates. I am a member of the Angel Mentorship Group, and hence my presence this afternoon on this session to benefit from what promises to be a very informative um, session on real estate. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more. Thank you, Naman and Mr. Chohan. Thank you, Yannick. So we'll start uh, the session by, uh, by Naman uh, asking the questions. So, so if you have any comments from your experience, Naman, you could also narrate that. And then we'll ask uh, Yannick as well to give her comment and questions. So let's begin. So Mr. J, uh, our clients basically, sometimes we have, an, uh, we have a sophisticated client and sometimes we have a client who does not even know the ABC of a real estate transaction and, uh, and the financing as well. So if we have to summarize in a layman's terms, what is a refinancing? Refinancing is a part of mortgage financing uh, on your property by way of a mortgage. So there are two possible ways in which you might uh, finance or refinance. So if you have a new house, for example, you need the financing for the first time and uh, a new family may buy a house and needs the financing. But refinancing is essentially where uh, the mortgage has expired and now the, the family needs a new mortgage on the property. So there are two possible reasons for the new mortgage. One is because the previous mortgage has expired. And uh, the second reason is that uh, the amount of money that you need might need to be borrow, might need to be increased because you have other financial needs, which can be accommodated by borrowing a greater amount of money you obtain first time around from the bank. So refinancing is an arrangement where you ask the bank or a private lender for the mortgage funds to be used for either increasing your mortgage or uh, 
or renew the mortgage. So these are the two situations in which you do the refinancing. Yes. Uh, thanks for your valuable insight, Mr. Day. So my second question is, uh, it's from the perspective of a new lawyer. Uh, how does one obtain the mortgage funds? How do you, sorry? How does one obtain the mortgage funds? Yes, I will answer the question from both the client's point of view and the lawyer's point of view. You see, first of all, from the client's point of view, um, you make uh, an application. And if you have done an application, you have an existing mortgage on the property, then very often it, the bank will simply require a confirmation that you wish to renew the mortgage. And uh, why would you renew the mortgage is because there are two concepts that I like to explain, uh, Naman. One of them is the understanding of the principle of amortization. And second is the principle of term. Amortization is a time frame, very often anything from 25 years uh, range to more or less amount of time period required to pay off the entire amount of the loan by blended payments of principal and interest. So that's the uh, arrangement when the mortgage is first obtained from typically a bank. So the first mortgage is typically obtained from a bank because the banks will charge an interest rate is equal to a certain percentage point above the basic bank rate. And therefore that's the cheapest mortgage you can get. And it's a very organized industry where the banks are in the professional business of lending. Uh, the money to the uh, to the public. So that's the application you make. And you make the application when the term is expired. The term of a mortgage is usually the time frame of about two years to sometimes three years, but typically uh, it is a short period of time than the amortization period. At that time, the interest rate may change and the bank will usually ask the question to you, do you wish to renew the mortgage? And when you have a stable history, the bank is happy to have you renew your particular mortgage and continue uh, the mortgage. Now, from the lawyer's point of view, you get a letter from the bank saying that we have agreed to refinance the mortgage. And therefore, would you do a title search and then confirm the title with us? So from the lawyer's point of view, you have to watch and they will come to the lawyer only when there is a refinancing where the amount of the mortgage is bigger than the current amount on the title. So what you are doing as a lawyer is to put a new mortgage on the title and discharge the old mortgage. So that's the lawyer's role. Perfect, thanks Mr. G. So uh, now we would like just your comments about the Canadian population profile as to which age group is more more inclined or would is more uh, would be more when we when we talk about obtaining financing, which age group would be more seen uh, as to looking for the financing? So, so let me answer the question from two points of view: the lawyer's point of view as a practice in the mortgage refinancing, and also from the public point of view, what is happening to the demographics of Canada? See, first of all, this is demographics of Canada will not be discussed in the law school or any of the training programs but it is a good market to work in for the lawyers. And the reason is that uh, lawyers are looking, we are in a private enterprise business model of working as lawyers. And therefore we need to figure out where can we find income, an income which is reasonably compatible with our lifestyle and ability to make reasonable income. So that's why the refinancing makes a very good uh, arrangement for the lawyers since you can usually uh, decide on the date on which exactly you're going to close. If the mortgage is less than 50,000, you can even act for both the sides. But if you're acting only for the bank, then you have to have a different lawyer on the borrower's side. So that's the arrangement. And the reason for that arrangement is that in the Ontario system, unlike Quebec or the civil law systems, that each lawyer is responsible to their own clients and the bank would be the primary client and therefore you are doing the title search for them. So I think in that kind of uh, practice, since the, there is uh, money needed and the family needs to live in the house, then the fees are not difficult to collect. So that is very important for a, a lawyer to, to know that. 
And this area of mortgage uh, practice is expanding because the Canadian population is reaching a point where the number of children born in a family is very limited. And the number of people who are the current uh, medical and nutritional systems of the country is an advanced economy. There are more people who are uh, seniors now. And the senior people need to still continue living in the houses or make arrangements. And therefore, it is an area in which the clients need to think about the mortgages, as well as the lawyers need to think about the mortgages. And it's a, an area of practice which is very desirable for lawyers to enter into. Uh, thanks for your wise comments, Mr. J. And uh, I would have to say that this topic is, is never covered in the law schools. And uh, from the sociological point of view, it was really valuable. So uh, my next question is about the different types of lenders involved in such transactions. Uh, when we say about A lenders, B lenders, uh, what are the banking rules with regard to them? Um, the banking rules are very elaborate, actually. See, what happens, the banks are also in the business of lending. In, in, in the lending business of the banks, uh, they're controlled by, the, by essentially the banking rules, which permit them to lend the money to the customer or the owner of the house based on certain ratio of the value of the property. And the second criteria that is important to them is also at income. So is the reason for these two issues to be important is that the bank wants 100% guarantee for the lending they do. If you look at any bank, any time, the primary concern in the bank's mind is that can they protect their interest 100%? And how do they protect it? By the the lending proportions by percentage of the value of the property. So very often they will have an appraiser evaluate the property value, and they will then provide 75% of the value of the property as the mortgage principal amount that they will lend on that particular property. So they do an appraisal, send a letter to the lawyer, and uh, then basically you, you borrow the 75%, if you're buying a new house, you have to come up with the balance of the down payment, and they want to know that you have the down payment from your own funds. So these are all securities insured, ensuring the bank's security in terms of collection in the event that you fail to make the payment. So I think that uh, it's very important to understand the proportion rule, and the rule of income. Now, a lot of people, you see, now this is from the lawyer's, the banking point of view. The lawyer does not get involved in the evaluation of the property. It is important that he does not get involved in the evaluation of the property. And I think the lenders are there to provide the mortgage. Many lenders are what, so to speak, tied agents. That means they will work for one particular bank only at a time because the banks are very competing with other banks also in the marketplace and they want their agents to concentrate on simply selling their mortgage funds to the people because they're making money out of the interest rate that they can charge to the customer. I think from the customer point of view, meaning the client point of view, the, the arrangement of the financing is based on the income as well as the, uh, the ability of the person to secure the loan for the mortgage from the value point of view. So how do you obtain an appraiser that will evaluate the value properly. So it depends on who appoints the appraiser. If the appraiser is appointed by the bank, they will tend to be very conservative because they don't want to be liable for negligence in case the value was not properly done and the marketplace actually was uh, insecure and fluctuating and therefore the bank lost the money when they lent 75% uh, of the value of the property and when the time came that the borrower could not uh, make the payment, they need to cover their 75% value by selling the property. So the 25% margin is to ensure that the fees of the real estate agent uh, or the cost of selling is then covered in the 25% margin that they leave uh, 
uh, in terms of the security. Now, if you remember the, that about 20 years ago, we had a, a great big financial crisis in North America arising from the American uh, situation where they were lending at a very high ratio, but the Canadian banks are very conservative, rule, uh, control very centrally with the rules to lend only a certain amount of money. And the reason for that is that if the bank did not get paid their mortgage monthly payment, then they will commence a power of sale or foreclosure proceedings to try to recover their money. These are different procedures. I won't go into the technical detail in this meeting, but it's important to understand that uh, for the senior people in the community, it is also important for them to realize how the mortgage system works. So in this meeting, I'll not talk about the reverse mortgages, but I think it's important to recognize that most people who have a regular mortgage need to make sure that the financial ability to make payments on the monthly payment is critical to ensure that the mortgage continues on the property. Thank you, Mr. J. And uh, any comments on private lending? Oh, yes. I think in terms of the private lenders, there is no restriction in terms of the private lending. If you create a lending system in a bank, then you have to have a, a proper uh, arrangement. I, I think just to give you one story that I went through, there was an accountant who came to Canada, was a senior accountant in Zambia, and he couldn't find a job. So finally, I suggested to him that he can do private lending. So anybody can lend privately to anybody else. So a private lender then should uh, take the precaution, if you're a lender, they should take the precaution of ensuring the same rules that the bank follow. Namely, is the person from income point of view, as well as the value of the property point of view, is there sufficient security from the borrower so that the private lender will not be jeopardized in the event that he could not make the payment. So I think the, the person that I was talking about you know, he couldn't get a job. Therefore, he entered the private lending business. He was extremely successful doing it. And I did a lot of mortgages for him. And he launched the business where he was able to, to make a career out of simply lending from his own fund. So the private lending is uh, an open arena for anybody to lend. And there are lots of private lenders. And if you go to a mortgage broker, very often they will also have a list of the private lenders who can also lend on the on the understanding that uh, the broker will find the security for them to, to deal with, but it's not the broker's role also to ensure the criteria which the private lender will use for the purpose of lending. But the private lenders are very often more flexible than the rigid rules of the bank. And that's why it's important for the borrowers to recognize that if the bank rules are rigid, then the private lenders can play a role and you can ask the mortgage broker to provide a mortgage that is then uh, from a private lender. Thank you, Mr. J. So apart from the person taking the financing, what are the players involved? Well, I, I think that I'll talk in terms of both the fees of the broker and the fees of the lawyer. That these are the costs uh, that uh, the borrower may encounter. So typically the fees of the lawyers are anything from $500 to $1,500. And uh, depends very much on your name, reputation, your seniority, and what you will typically charge in real estate. But I think a large proportion of lawyers in Ontario, and there are almost 55,000 lawyers now in Ontario, and uh, growing by the rate of almost 2,000 every year, so the competition in the lowest is extremely high. I would, I would uh, estimate that about 30, 40, or 50% of the lowest would, some, some, would do some kind of real estate work. So for the younger lowest in our group, I'm encouraging them to create a group so that they can provide the service and also make some cash income. In, uh, and therefore, it is a helpful thing for lawyers to, to sort of uh, deal with this issue as well. So I think in... You know, so I think that hopefully that answered your questioning. Yes, Mr. J. So I just want to make a comment on that. So the lawyers new into practice, I say that building a network with the players in the industry, real estate industry, it comes in handy. It, it helps you to generate work. When you're looking for the work in the beginning, it really comes in handy. So, so I said, let me comment on that. I think there was a good thing that uh, Naman, you 
when you were in New Brunswick, uh, you went from Ontario and you were able to make connections with the real estate the agents and brokers and you get them their cards and the, the work began to flow. And then what typically happens, and as it happened to you as well, that you get busy enough so that you ne then need a clerk. And I think that a clerk then does a lot of the basic input. There's a lot of paperwork involved in, in mortgage financing. Yes. And, uh, and there are programs now, computer programs available to lawyers, uh, such as Lawyer Done Deal and Unity programs in which you can input the data. And there's a program uh, called TerraView where these programs interact with each other for the purpose of registering your mortgage transaction and then putting it on the title. So I think in terms of the lawyer's practice, it is very important to have the connections and the network and the understanding of these uh, computer programs for the purpose of carrying out your issues. So just the main comment I can make is that we are in a private enterprise business. So if you concentrate heavily as many lawyers do, to make good income, then the emphasis shifts from being a professional person trying to certify the title, your emphasis shifts to appointing a, a paralegal type of a person to have a clerk who will do the work. And then if there's not sufficient amount of supervision or care and concern, and not enough amount of sensitivity in the part of the lawyers to check the, the searches, check the reporting letter, and do a large number of things that are now currently done by the lawyers to certify the title to the bank or to the client. Actually, I won't go through all of them, but in the more recent years, we have the insurance for the title, which has become very significant. Now, recognizing insurance company, recognizing the need for the security that the title is a good one, they have an insurance arrangement which certifies the title. Most lawyers will ask their clients to obtain the title insurance and they charge the cost to the client and their title is insured. So if something went wrong in terms of the title, so it's important for the public to recognize and for the lawyers to recognize that the issue of the lawyer certifying title is not a mechanical event. It is a lot of work involved and a lot of variables in which something can go wrong. So the highest area of negligence for the lawyers in Ontario is in the real estate area. And the reason for that is that in the, in the fees are low, not sufficient time for the lawyer to work on it, the delegation, lack of supervision, and the lack of sensitivity given to the lawyer. So there is from the law pro, a lot of the literature and materials provided, but there is uh, the lawyer's busy in terms of getting the work done to not have enough time to look at all the rules and the carefulness. Because if you're very careful, it takes more time and there's not sufficient time and not sufficient income out of this area of law for people to, to do their work thoroughly. Thank you, Mr. J. Uh, my next question is related to the setting up, up of the legal practice in mortgages. So how does one launch a successful legal practice in mortgages? How do you make a successful mortgage practice? Yes. Well, I think you mentioned the, uh, the networking arrangement. So there is one way to create a client base. So let me just go back to the history of what has happened in Ontario from the point of view of creating this kind of a practice. So you see, the real estate is now a specialty in the law. So how do you grow the practice? First of all, you must know the variables. So in the bar admission course, and even in the principles of real estate law in the JD degree, just Juris Doctor degree, or if you've done it from NCA degree point, NCA examination point of view, there is certain amount of understanding of the principles of mortgage that you learn. But I think apart from that, the, the development of the practice over the years has been that your community has become now centered around the social media that I think Yannick, I saw that is very adept at uh, using the social media today that can improve your practice. So from the time that I started practice in Ontario, where you wrote your name in the yellow pages and you went to the community and got to know them as you're doing in New Brunswick, that is becoming less significant than the social media that enables you to reach many more people simultaneously. And the media now allows you also to do videos, 
and and programs like this one which enables yeah. you to reach many more people than you could do by shaking hands with one person at a time <laughs> Thing in development of the practice the insurance industry has also flourished in ontario so that it has made it easier for the worry of the lawyers who used to certify the titles that worry has been shifted to the insurance uh, companies who then um, not only ensure the title but some some insurance companies will also insure the lawyer for negligence because there are two different areas of concern one is a concern for the title being proper and something missed out may have to be fixed up and the insurance company will take the responsibility but the other one is the lawyer's negligence liability as well that since he is certifying the title he has to be careful that everything that he did is a personal judgment involved on the part of the lawyer that enables him to evaluate that what he did was correct. So in terms of the marketing arrangement, what is happening in my view currently in Ontario is that uh, the lawyers are uh, um, busy trying to do more and more work and, uh, and then less and less of the technical nitty gritty works. It's happening in the US for example where the role of the law is now limited to essentially getting the client signed up and the insurance company takes over from there and then uh, the closing takes place he deals with the funds and the lawyer is more busy running around from the bank to the client to his office than trying to do the technical nitty-gritty work so the current status of the legal work is concentrating more on marketing approach to the legal practice rather than the nitty-gritty professional approach to the understanding of the title. And that is done because of social media, because of insurance, and because of the fact that there is a lot of uh, um, kind of uh, competition in the marketplace. So I think we might be, we might be in the 10 minutes be um, cut out, but if we are, then I think we'll try to shorten the, the, the this uh, program yes. by putting it in the next few minutes and closing it off. Okay, Mr. J. So, Mr. J, my next question to you is, uh, what are the lawyer's duties with regard to the title searching and zoning? Well, I think the lawyer's duty in the common law, because he rep the lawyer represents the interest of the purchaser in particular, then he has to search the title and then searching the title that is the land title system and the register system and he provides the proper title searches the property and then certifies the title to the client or the bank and that's the the duty of the lawyer but since in historically what has happened is that the areas of concern has expanded from simply the title issue to the question of many other things such as the planning act yeah. such as the zoning because the housing is constructed in, in, in defined areas of the town and the bylaws are there to make sure that the construction of the house is adequate and complies with the building code and therefore all these requirements has increased the concern for the lawyer to ensure that not only the title but surrounding other issues such as zoning bylaws etc also complied with and is of course that there's taxation local taxation uh, which also affects the lawyer's work since the tax unpaid is also an encumbrance on the title. So he has to search the taxes, the title, as well as the bylaws and so on. So there are a number of other similar issues that affects the work of the lawyer and the lawyer has to keep up to date on the areas of concern so that he provides a proper title. If he does not, then the insurance kicks in there and there is a, a liability that he has to deal with. Yes, thank you, Mr. Jay. And uh, the next question for you, Mr. Jay, is about the first and second mortgages on the property. Like, well, that's very, I think that's, there's very good training provided in the educational programs in terms of the first and second mortgages. So I think that uh, for the public, I think for public and the lawyers also, the lawyers get much more training, but the training is uh, they provide in a very technical fashion in the in the JD program as well as the NCA program for real estate, in which the understanding between the Land Titles Act and Registry Act is is greatly emphasized. But what is not sufficiently emphasized is the, the area of how to then 
use techniques to minimize the negligence. This is an evaluation by the lawyer to look at the title and reach the right conclusion. For example, if you study and, and, and see, see that the master of titles in Land Titles Act is a fund, but that fund does not help too much to protect the lawyer's interest because there are many other issues that you have to deal with other than the title itself. So historically, the, the, fund, the, the fund created to support the master of titles in certifying the title does not help the lawyer too much because many other issues have arisen in terms of what he needs to do to certify the title to the, to the client and educational process does not sufficiently emphasize the decision-making and judgment-making process which creates the negligence. So that's the role of the lawyer in the current uh, industry. Thank you, Mr. G. And uh, Mr. G, my last question to you is, in case a mortgage defaults, what are the remedies that a mortgagee has? I think uh, yeah, most people who borrow the money do not think, nor do the lawyers necessarily think they uh, ever talk uh, to, about this issue to the clients. So, but essentially there are uh, several rights that the lender has and which the public should be more aware. The lawyers, of course, we need to know actually what are the rights because we, we, we never, I have never seen a lawyer trying to advise them ever on the rights of the client to protect their interest in the event that something went wrong. So here is the issues. Issue number one is that in terms of the remedy, the power of sale is the most common remedy by a lender, which enables the lender to give a notice and outside the court system, essentially sell out the property using the name of the mortgagee on the title and register. So once you comply with the procedure as a lender, you have a right to sell out the property without going to court. That's the power of sale, which is the most common method by which the lender will essentially protect his interest. The second is the foreclosure. Foreclosure is saying that if you're mortgagee number two or three, for example, then your interest will enable you to, to pay out the first mortgage or a mortgage that is superior prior to yours. And then you give a notice of foreclosure to the owner who has the last equity interest in the property. And once you can uh, uh, give the notice to him. And if you follow the procedure correctly by giving a notice to all the required parties based on the search of the title, then you are protected in terms of your right to foreclose the property. So in a foreclosure, there is a right of redemption which can be exercised by the owner. So I think this kind of discussion for the lawyers as well as the people who are going to default is very important to understand the right to protect their interest in a notice of uh, foreclosure dispute by the owner. In a foreclosure or a power of sale, the right of possession also is very important because in a, in a sale, power of sale, you can, you can sell the property, but getting possession of the property still requires a statement of claim and claiming possession. So these are the things that are relevant in the foreclosure. So that's the remedy number two. The third one that is typically available to the lender is the action commenced on the so-called covenant. So the mortgage is also a contract. And therefore in the contract, the borrower has agreed to pay a certain amount on a monthly basis, which is called a blended payment of interest and principal, which declines in terms of the, the capital amount as you go forward because the amount remains the same. So the blended payment is then uh, basically a monthly obligation of the borrower on which the lender can bring a, a, a civil action and say that I want my money, essentially. But it's not usually exercised because you can imagine that in the time that you bring litigation, the problem of further payments continues. So that's not usual, but it is available as a remedy. So I think we'll have to conclude the matter now because yeah. the time is running out on the Zoom program. So thank you, Mr. J. All your insights were, are very invaluable and uh, I feel that for our viewers, they will be very useful. And, uh, thank, thank, you. thank you for your participation. Thank you, Yannick. If you have any question, we have a, uh, about a minute and a half left to ask your question. 
No questions, Mr. J. Thank you as usual for sharing. You know, you're always a walking <laughs> reservoir of practical guidance. This was extremely insightful. And as Naman mentioned, I'm quite sure that the viewers will benefit a lot from seeing this video. So thank well, you. Think, thank you, Yannick. And thank you, Naman, for participation. And those listening, I'd like to suggest that we will be creating a group to support the public because there are lots of problems both for the lawyers and the public in this area. And the industry is not coordinated in terms of the role of the lawyer as well as the broker. And therefore this lack of coordination creates other problems as well. So I'm trying to create a team where we can work together and, and protect the interest of the borrower because the banks have the facility and ability to protect their interest, but the borrower very often is left alone without the understanding and protection that is required for them. So I thank you very much for your participation and hope to the audience that it was a helpful exercise. Thank you. Thanks for having us here, Mr. Thank you.